Hello, everyone, and welcome to week seven of Poll 205, Women in Politics. Now, this week, I want to talk a little bit about voters' perceptions of women who run for office. And one thing that I want to call attention to is that in your book, um, they pretty much argue that women aren't really um, at any specific electoral disadvantages. So they look at the media, voter bias, and campaign finance. And across the board, they show that, well, women get about uh, the same, if not more, news coverage than male candidates. So no, they're not disadvantaged by the media. Um, they looked at campaign finance and they said, no, women earn just about as uh, 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 just about the same, if not more, or earn more money in their campaigns. And then they switch to the issue of whether or not voters disproportionately evaluate male or female candidates on either their traits or their issue knowledge. And here's where I take a little bit of uh, disagreement with your book here because they just ask voters, hey, do you think, uh, you know, how, how much would you say that this candidate is a strong leader? Would you say that they're competent, empathetic, trustworthy, or qualified? And as we see here on figure 4.3 in your book for chapter four on page 62, they see virtually no differences between how men and women candidates were valued on their traits either across either party. You see these results are basically the same. And then when they asked voters to uh, provide evaluations on issue competency, so how well would this candidate deal with nas uh, national security or crime, the economy, healthcare, abortion, again, these bars are almost identical. And they use this data here to suggest that voters don't really seem to have any gender biases. And this is where my research comes in, because I argue that a lot of these studies will ask these questions in a vacuum without any context. And of course, there's no reason for us to think otherwise that, you know, men and women, politicians vary in any significant way. But when we expose them, when we expose voters and ex participants in experimental studies to content and behavior and messaging from male and female candidates, when we hold those messages constant and all we do is vary the gender of the individual delivering that message, we see significant differences in how voters evaluate those candidates, which is indicative that there is something going on there ostensibly gender is playing some type of role in driving those evaluations because everything else is held constant or equal. So I just kind of want to go over the uh, gender stereotype literature in a little bit more detail today because I think it greatly aligns with where we're at in the semester and this is what my professional research focuses on. So I'm really passionate about this topic. So I just wanted to share a little bit of the research that I've done and share with you guys in today's lecture. Um, so just, I want to go over three broad findings um, that political scientists generally arrive at when we're studying whether or not gender stereotypes influence voter behavior. Uh, so there's three big findings. The first one finds that voters may be more likely to punish women candidates when they're too feminine. Um, this kind of creates the image that they might not have what it takes uh, to be competitive in this hyper-masculinized environment such as politics. On the other hand, there's plenty of studies that demonstrate that feminine stereotypes can actually legitimize women's candidate issue competency, particularly on feminine political issues such as childcare, healthcare, or education, because we inherently believe that women are more compassionate. Uh, we think that they do a better job at legislating on those issues. And then the final finding in the literature suggests that there's no impact. Uh, it kind of like the results that were shared in your book in chapter four, that when we flat out ask individuals, um, is a male or a woman candidate better uh, at handling one of these issues? Do you find them more compassionate? Do you actually find them more trustworthy? On its face value, um, people say no. Uh, so we are kind of at this multi crossroads here. There's like a fork in the road when it comes to studying this, this issue. 
we see different scholars arrive at all kinds of different conclusions. So why is this? Why do some studies find that um, voters punish women candidates when they're too feminine? Why do some studies find that uh, feminine stereotypes benefit candidates? And how do some studies suggest that, you know, there's no difference at all? And my whole argument is that that really boils down to how we measure stereotypes and how we activate the stereotype process. So in your book, uh, the example that they use to suggest that stereotypes don't play a role in voter behavior, there's no stimulus activating a stereotype consideration. What's very popular in the social psychology research is that stereotypes lay dormant until they're activated. So if we don't activate them, of course, those attitudes aren't going to manifest when asked. So that's kind of what my research does. I provoke people, um, or not necessarily provoke, but I provide contextual environments for which people can consider the differences uh, between a male candidate or a female candidate. So let me just jump into the kind of theoretical foundation of my research. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all kinds of different studies measure stereotypes in a lot of different ways. They can present uh, participants with kind of hypothetical candidates, or they can, uh, you know, show them campaign speeches or advertisements uh, or, or whatever. Um, there's just very little kind of consistency or consensus for how we measure this type of stuff in the first place. So I'm just suggesting that we take this, uh, our, our study of gender stereotypes, all the way back to the social psychology literature and political psychology literature that's really done a phenomenal job at breaking down what exactly a stereotype is. And for social psychologists, they argue that all so social judgment and how we perceive in-groups and out-groups really boils down to two distinct evaluations that we make about an individual. So first is how warm we perceive that individual and how competent we perceive that individual. So I think this is really fascinating. Let's take um, uh, each of these concepts in a little bit more detail. So warmth is exactly what it sounds like. How warm or cold do we feel towards a certain group or individual that we've just met? And really the subconscious evaluation that's going on here is whether you perceive that group or that individual to be a threat that is competing against you. The other critical component of the evaluation is competence. So here the evaluation is more concerned with how we perceive that group's social status. And each of these combinations produce distinct emotional reactions, which I argue is the thing we really need to be measuring in order to determine whether or not a stereotype belief was activated and influenced a voter's evaluation or perception of a candidate. This also has roots in political science referred to as effective intelligence theory, but I'm not going to get too into that uh, in this lecture. Uh, but let's take an example um, of what exactly all of this means. So. For instance, uh, say we've just met someone and, and we feel really warm towards them. Uh, we don't really perceive them as a threat to, to, um, to us. We don't find them to be competing with us. So we have pretty positive emotional reactions about that person, right? Well, this is where competence comes in and it's critical to, to analyze social judgment on these two dimensions. So if we feel really warm towards a certain group, and perceive them to have low competence or low social status, then that produces feelings of pity and despair, these negative emotions, because we feel sympathy for these groups. When we perceive groups as very warm and also very competent, this produces emotions of admiration and pride, and is generally how individuals perceive others who fit into their same in-group or you know, share the same racial, gender, ethnic, or religious identities. Now the low warmth evaluations are where it starts to get really interesting. So low warmth, low competence evaluations produce feelings of disgust. We feel cold towards these groups because we see them as competing against us for access to resources. So poor people who want what we have is a good example. Uh, and we feel disgust towards them because we perceive them to have low competence or low social status. 
The low warmth, high competence category produces envious emotional reactions. So we feel coldly towards the group. Rich people is a good example. We want what they have. And we feel positively towards them because we see them with high competence and high social status, something that we want to be. And what my research investigates is whether we can find evidence of voters stereotyping male and female candidates if we use a more nuanced measurement like this that more accurately captures the fundamental dimensions underlying the stereotype process. So the first thing I wanted to do is let's just start from scratch. Let's look at campaign advertisements and let's see how they make appeals to warmth and competence. And if they fall into these categories here from the previous slide, pull that up real quick. If campaign advertisements make cold appeals but low competence appeals, then maybe we should expect those, you know, viewers of those advertisements to feel contempt. And perhaps that will drive their evaluations of the candidates. And what I'm trying to tease out in my research is, does that vary between male and female candidates at all? So without belaboring the point, a few years ago, I painfully watched uh, 1,400 congressional campaign advertisements that aired in the general election between 2010 and 2016, and I coded them on over 100 different dimensions, such as the emotional appeal that they made. Was it positive, negative, uh, humorous, enthusiastic, angry, sad, fearful? Uh, and then I looked at all of the different competency claims that were made in the advertisement. So ultimately what I found is that candidates make competency claims in either one of two ways. Either they emphasize their merit, uh, so they're talking about their experience, their qualifications, their leadership skills, things that make them qualified to be a politician, or uh, candidates will focus on their values. Uh, so talking about things like family and morals and principles and ideas of democracy and normative expectations for government and things like that. And so what I wanted to do is to create kind of a map, uh, a very similar dimension of warmth and competence uh, that could kind of encapsulate every type of political advertisement that we see in the United States. So um, the only other thing that I want to add is that there's three major types of political advertisements that candidates use. Those can be promotion ads, which just feature the candidate, and they talk about how awesome they are. There's contrast ads, where the ad will usually begin with the candidate talking about how awesome they are, and then they'll pivot to how terrible their opponent is. And the final type of advertisement is the classic attack ad. So generally the candidate isn't featured in that at all. And the ad is exclusively based um, on discrediting their opponent. So when we look at those three types of ads, promotion ads, contrast ads, and attack ads, and we try to map them on whether they make um, negative or positive emotional appeals or merit or values appeals, we end up with this interesting taxonomy uh, of stereotype content in political advertisements. So let me just show you briefly in a little bit more detail what I found and what this means, and then I'll show you some of my favorite examples of each of these advertisements. Um, and these were the advertisements that I showed in my experimental analysis. So let's just start with the promotional ads. There were four different types of promotional ads that I found that fit into the stereotype uh, taxonomy of, of warmth and competence. So the revivalist is a really cool type of ad. It's a promotional ad where the candidate is talking about how awesome they are, but they're using negative emotional appeals to do that. And before I started this process, I thought to myself, well, why on earth would you use negative appeal to negative emotions like fear or sadness or anger when you're trying to talk about how awesome you are. And it's a really interesting strategy. So the revivalist is a promotional ad. It uses negative emotions. And then the candidate just focuses on their values. So the ad will generally start as, you know, America is in more debt than it's ever been in our nation's history and things are terrible. But don't worry, I'm here to save the day because I value family and uh, ethics, right? It's very strange. It's a very strange strategy. I'll show you examples of all of these or a few, depending on how much time we have at the very end um, of this slide. 
The Maverick is the same thing. It's a negative ad, um, but it's promotion. So the candidate's just talking about themselves, but they're using this negative emotion to paint this really terrible picture of America. But don't worry, I have the expertise necessary to turn this country around and get us back on track again. And then the last two are the, the positive promotion ads. So the native is positive emotions, promotional, and it talks about the candidate's values. Whereas the philanthropist is again, promotional ad uses positive emotion, and they talk a lot about their experiences and the things that they've accomplished. Contrast ads, there's only two typologies here. Uh, you have the charmer, which is an individual who will contrast themselves to their opponent. But when they contrast themselves, they're talking about how excellent their, their values are and how much they um, value family. Uh, and honesty, and that's why they deserve to be elected. Uh, and then the expert ad, um, instead of relying on values to convey to voters why their experience, or I'm sorry, why why they are qualified, they uh, focus solely on their experience, their merit, and their qualifications. So there's no emotional um, difference here because these ads, these contrast ads, are as equally positive as they are negative. And lastly, when I was doing my content analysis on attack ads, I found that really there's no distinction between how much a candidate will attack their opponent on either their values or their merit. I find that candidates, when they attack, they throw the whole kitchen sink at their opponent. So they're not really concerned about like, I'm just gonna attack my opponent on their values, or I'm just gonna attack my opponent uh, on their on their merit or on their experience. I found, in my research at least, that when you attack, you attack on everything. Can't, uh, character, traits, experience, everything. But the one interesting thing that I did find is that the emotional appeal varies a lot. Um, and I was surprised to find so many uh, positive emotion attack ads. So this is basically when a candidate uses humor to attack their opponent. Um, and what's really interesting is that this is most common in female versus female races. And I argue that um, that's, you know, just more evidence of candidates being cognizant of gender stereotypes. They don't want to be the, you know, quote, bitchy female candidate who's, you know, um, recklessly attacking their opponent. Um, they actually uh, st strategically use humor to, to help soften their image and not get backlash for being too negative or too aggressive, too masculine, not feminine, right? So let's look at a couple of examples of each of these advertisements. They're some of my favorite and I hope you enjoy them. When I went to Washington, our economy was already in collapse. Everyone was looking for a bailout and the national debt had doubled under Bush. As a new member, I decided to lead by example. I froze my own pay, voted against the bank bailout, and took on Wall Street to protect your money. I'm Mary Jo Kilroy, and I sponsor this ad because we can't go back to the same failed policies that got us into this mess. More than 25 Ohioans are dying every week from drug overdoses. Heroin addictions become an epidemic that's sweeping across our communities, destroying lives and tearing families apart. Fortunately, there's some hope on the way. Working together with Democrats and Republicans, I passed legislation to help break the grip of addiction by investing in prevention, treatment, and recovery, empowering law enforcement, and stopping the overprescribing of painkillers. We can turn the tide. I'm Rob Portman, and I approve this message. I'm Jean Shaheen, and I approve this message. The real Scott Brown? Not this guy. This guy. He voted big oil more than $20 billion in taxpayer subsidies, but we got higher gas prices. Scott Brown saved Wall Street $19 billion, but we got foreclosures. This guy is getting more than a quarter million from a company moving U.S. jobs to China, cashing in by selling us out. Scott Brown, not for New Hampshire. Never was, never will be. I'm Tom Reed, and I approve this message. 
Hi, it's me, Jim, again. It's back to school time here in Minnesota. And you guessed it, Tax and Tarot Clark has a tax for that. Want to buy some crayons? She's got a sales tax increase for that. Drive your kids to school. She's got a gas tax hike for that. Buy a backpack. She's got a tax for that, too. So as you take your kids to school every day, remember this. Tarot Clark loves taxes. Democrats, independents, and Republicans can agree. We need more jobs in Southern Arizona. And while the politicians bicker, I'm getting things done. Saving the A-10 and our defense jobs from reckless cuts. Investing in vital infrastructure projects and the jobs they create. Keeping the Terry Bell Postal Facility open. And passing a new law to fast track our vets for good jobs at the border. I'm Martha McSally and I approve this message because I'm deployed to D.C. to get results for Advertising. Michael Bennett is the kind of public servant we admire. He's hardworking and reliable. Surrounded by gridlock and obstructionism, Michael Bennett has worked both sides of the aisle. He helped craft an overhaul of the education bill. Secured an energy tax credit for wind and solar. And understands Colorado's public lands are our greatest treasure. On the issues that affect Colorado most, Michael Bennett has our back. I'm Michael Bennett, and I approve this message. I think there's a clear choice. Jean Shaheen's always fought for small businesses. Her Small Business Jobs Act cut our taxes. Jean Shaheen championed innovation grants. We've hired 50 new people. Jean Shaheen actually cares for the people of New Hampshire. And Scott Brown is just in it for himself. Scott Brown is in the pockets of big oil. Scott Brown voted tax breaks for companies that outsource jobs. I think that's just wrong. Scott Brown is for Scott Brown and big money. Jean Shaheen makes New Hampshire her business. I'm Jean Shaheen and I approve this message. We can count on Jean Shaheen. More than 2 million American jobs have already gone to China. Jackie Walorski supports the bad trade policies that send our jobs to places like Mexico and China. That's wrong. I've helped provide more than $30 billion in tax relief for small businesses. That creates new jobs. I oppose NAFTA and vote against every single bad trade agreement that sends Indiana jobs overseas. I'm Joe Donnelly. I approve this ad because there should be a job for every Hoosier and a Hoosier for every job. Our national debt is $16 trillion, $51,000 for every man, woman, and child. If we want to teach our children values like hard work and living within their means, we need people in Washington willing to set an example. Leaders focused on the future who ask where can we save, not how much can we spend. Christy Nome, one of us, fighting for all of us. I'm Christy Nome, and I approve this message. Okay, so lastly, I just want to take you through some of the uh, results that I found. So the first thing I wanted to see was whether male or female candidates differed significantly in the type of messaging strategy that they used when communicating to voters. And based upon the, the research in this field, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that women candidates often go out of their way to convey how experienced they are because, you know, uh, this idea of the double bind that they face, which I think the double bind um, is discussed in this chapter. If not, it, it should be a, a concept that has been discussed in previous chapters. The double bind refers to this process of, you know, women candidates having to just walk this tightrope of not being too feminine, where they're stereotyped as being ineffective, but also not being stereotyped as too masculine as to be perceived as unfit for office and of bad character. So based upon the, 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 the literature and the research on the double bind, many scholars find that women do in fact uh, engage in more type of activities and messaging that convey their experience and their qualifications. So I had two separate hypotheses that I wanted to test. And that is one, that women will be more likely than their male candidates to utilize a merit-based messaging strategy because they're trying to overcompensate for 
female stereotypes. And that too, on the other hand, we should see women be significantly less likely than men to utilize values-based messaging strategies. And that's exactly what I find um, in my research. So these uh, are three of the merit-based strategies that we just talked about. So the expert was the contrast ad where the candidate uses their merit to contrast themselves to their opponent. The philanthropist was the promotional ad that used positive emotion and a merit-based appeal. And then the maverick was the other promotional ad, but used negative emotion to also highlight the candidate's merit and expertise. And basically you see the pink dots, which are the predicted probabilities are higher than the blue dots across each of these. So that does provide some evidence that women are more likely to engage in merit-based strategies than males. So there's some support for this hypothesis here. And then the second thing I wanted to analyze was, are women less likely to use values-based messaging strategies? If they're so concerned about being perceived as too feminine, then we should see women way less likely to engage in those type of messaging strategies. And I do find some evidence for that here as well. You notice that mostly uh, the pink dots are lower than the blue dots, which shows that men were more likely uh, to use values-based messaging and women were less likely to do so. So I think that this is what I argue, at least in my research, is this is empirical evidence that candidates kind of adjust and moderate their behavior with special regard to gender stereotypes in American society. Right, now, the last thing that I wanted to look at was how do voters respond to these advertisements, the same advertisements that I just showed you. So all else being equal, right? I mean, the, the message is, of course, it varies a little bit. Um, they don't have the same exact scripts, but I wanted to see, is a voter going to respond to a candidate who has a, a humorous attack ad? Are they going to respond differently based upon whether or not it's a male or a female candidate who's being attacked? And I do find some evidence of that. So I, I measured the uh, emotional... Uh, stuff first. I'm just going to throw these up here uh, for you guys to look at. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but uh, the whole underpinning of my theory is that it's, you know, these type of messages like produce really different emotional reactions. And that's kind of the, the, the hallmark, the indicator that the stereotype was activated because they have these really strong emotional reactions. Um, so I'm just going to throw these up here, not go into it in too much detail, but if you want to pause the video, feel free to take a look at it. So these were the emotional reactions to the merit-based strategies. Um, and when something is highlighted, that means that people were significantly more likely to feel that emotion in that specific category. So you can just see here's the male um, I'm sorry, the female and the male names for each type of um, merit-based strategy. So I did find significant emotional reactions there based upon the gender of who was delivering the advertisement. Um, and then here is the same, uh, here's the same figure for the values-based strategy. So really interesting stuff there if you want to take a look at it in more detail. But what I really want to get to, uh, without making this lecture too terribly long, um, is the probability of the voter uh, feeling favorable towards that candidate based, on, based upon what type of ad they were exposed to. So uh, in this figure, this is the, the average likelihood that the respondent reported that they would vote for that candidate, you know, based upon which candidate they uh, were exposed to. So keep in mind out of the, you know, 3000 some participants that I had in this study, um, each individual only watched one of the ads. So I'm comparing each of these to all of the others. Um, and what's super interesting is that when we look at the Joker, that's the positive emotion attack ad look at how much more favorable people were towards the female candidate who was attacked with humor but the male candidate who was attacked with humor far less uh appealing um in fact when we look at both types of attack ads the joker which uses positive emotion and the doomsdayer which uses negative emotion the female candidate here in the Joker is elevated way more. People were way more likely to report, um, you know, wanting to vote for that candidate 
than any other attack ad. So one thing that I argue in this research is that it, the, the stereotype of being a woman and being compassionate and trustworthy, that stereotype can help insulate women against attack ads that you know, are congruent kind of with that gender. So when the attack ad is positive and it's light and it's funny, it just doesn't really work against women. And I think that the, the feminine stereotypes kind of insulate women from, from those really severe attacks. And the rest of these uh, figures here are really just measuring whether or not voters responded differently to any of the other merit-based strategies. And what's really interesting is that for the most part, they're pretty equal. Um, there are no significant differences between the groups except for when we look at the expert category. So when a woman used a contrast ad against her opponent but emphasized her merit and her experience, voters were way more likely to support that female candidate um, when she used that type of contrast against a male candidate. When men, so the blue bar here on the expert, when men contrast themselves to a female opponent, and they say that they're more qualified and they've got more expertise than their female opponent, people are actually way less likely to be supportive of that candidate. So really interesting gender dynamics happening here. And then the last thing that I want to show you um, are those values-based messaging strategies. So were people more likely to punish female candidates if they used values-based strategies? No, not really. Uh, just looking at this data here, um, you know, men and women candidates who used values-based strategies were seen, you know, perceived pretty equally. Uh, people were just as likely to vote for the male candidate as they were the female candidate, regardless of what type of values-based strategy that they used. But again, um, there is marginal uh, significance here with the, the Charmer ad. So basically what I do find in my research is that people are most favorable towards women candidates when they contrast themselves and they can use merit-based claims or values-based claims but when they contrast themselves actively in an advertisement people are really really receptive to that at any rate that was just a little bit of uh research that i wanted to share with you guys since we were on the topic of women's experiences running for office and i really hope you enjoyed um, learning a little bit more about the, the research that I do, and I hope you enjoyed those political advertisements. Um, I, I think that there's something really interesting and, and special about the world of campaign advertisements. And so I think I'm just going to go ahead and cut it off here. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture and learned something new about gender stereotypes and campaign advertising. I hope you guys have a super wonderful week. Stay healthy, stay safe, and as always, thanks for watching.